Nahum. There's a lot of of uh, negative messages, I guess, if you want to call it that, to the to the people who have done evil. And uh, as as you know, we know and we would expect that uh, justice it hurts the one who it's coming on that deserves justice. Uh, but those who have been waiting for justice, those who uh, need justice in order for the, the the problems that are being given to them, the oppression that's happening to them to be relieved, of course it brings them uh, joy and, uh, and mercy in their eyes. So uh, let's read together in Nahum chapter 2. I'm just going to start in verse 1 and read through that chapter and, and uh, then we'll have a few uh, ideas to talk about, uh, about uh, Nahum from chapter 2. It says, Your enemy is coming to crush you, Nineveh. Man the ramparts, watch the roads, prepare your defenses, call out your forces. Even though the destroyer has destroyed Judah, the Lord will restore its honor. Israel's vine has been stripped of branches, but he will restore its splendor. Shields flash red in the sunlight. See the scarlet uniforms of the valiant troops. Watch as their glittering chariots move into position with a forest of spears waving above them. The chariots race recklessly through the streets and rush wildly through the squares. They flash like firelight and move as swiftly as lightning. The king shouts to his officers. They stumble in their haste, rushing to the walls to set up their defenses. The river gates have been torn apart. The palace is about to collapse. Nineveh's exile has been decreed and all the servant girls mourn its capture. They moan like doves and beat their breast in sorrow. Nineveh is like a leaking water reservoir. The people are slipping away. Stop, stop, someone shouts, but no one even looks back. Look out, uh, loot the silver, plunder the gold. There's no end to Nineveh's treasures, its vast uncounted wealth. Soon the city is plundered, empty and ruined. Hearts melt, knees shake. The people stand aghast, their faces pale and trembling. Where now is that great Nineveh? That den filled with young lions. It was a place where people, like lions and their cubs, walked freely without any fear. The lion tore up meat for his cubs and strangled prey for his mate. He filled his den with prey and his cavern, caverns with his plunder. I am your enemy, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Your chariots will soon go up in smoke. Your young men will be killed in battle. Never again will you plunder conquered nations. The voices of your proud messengers will be heard no more. Verse 1 of chapter 3 starts, What sorrow awaits Nineveh, the city of murder and lies. She's crammed with wealth and is never without victims. Hear the crack of whips? The rumble of wheels, horses' hooves pound, and chariots clatter wildly. And it goes on, of course, continuing in the description of the destruction that is coming upon a people who have set their heart on doing evil, set their heart on, on doing exactly opposite of what they know because they've been preached to. They've been told by prophets of God how to repent, how to turn, how to stay right, how to keep away from this kind of desolation, and yet... They've continued to behave in such a way that forces, forces God's hand in this matter. It wasn't too long ago that we were reading about Jonah and looking there, how that Jonah uh, looked back at God and basically accused God of being too good and too loving and, and too forgiving. And we see in Nahum, at some point, God has enough, even God. The God of all mercy and the God of love, the God who has poured himself into this book that we might understand his deep, passionate love for each one of us. He has a limit. He has a limit, and Assyria has reached that limit. Nahum's message of righteous judgment, it's terrible news for the Assyrians. But the Jewish hearts, they would have been lifted by this news. God's justice is sure and complete. And it is something that would have brought joy to their hearts. I want to talk more about that in a moment. But notice what Jesus says in John chapter 12, verse 44. Jesus shouted to the crowds, If you trust me, you're trusting not only me, but also God who sent me. For when you see me, you are seeing the one who sent me. I have come as a light to shine in this dark world so that all who put their trust in me will no longer remain in the dark. 
I will not judge those who hear me, but don't obey me, for I've come to save the world, not to judge it, but all who reject me and my message, they will be judged on the day of judgment by the truth I have spoken. I don't speak on my own authority. The Father who sent me has commanded me what to say and how to say it. And I know his commands lead to eternal life. So say, so I say whatever the Father tells me to say. He says, look, I'm not here to judge you right now. That's not my mission. My mission is to save, okay? And he, and he goes on to say, and this message of salvation, it's not just something I've come up with. It is, uh, it is eternal. It is something that has been in the mind of God to save mankind forever. He's known what was going to occur, and he has prepared, he has made a plan, a way for even us, those of us, all of us who have turned our backs on him, who have uh, loved the world more than God, who have, who have uh, loved sin and chosen sin over and over in our lives. It says God has a plan, and you will be judged according to the words that Jesus has spoken. We'll be judged but whether or not we have kept his word, whether or not we have treasured it in our hearts, whether or not God's word has become to us a joy and a delight and something that we relish and something that we, we can't wait to partake of and to listen to and to, to grow in. He says this is a, a, a problem for us. If we're not listening carefully, reading and understanding the word of God, it's something that would bring joy to our hearts. But... Notice what he says uh, to those who don't obey him. It's, it's judgment that's coming on them. In fact, Jesus says, this is not the time that I'm here to, to judge you. I'm, I'm here to save you. But he leaves open the fact that there will be a day of judgment. It is coming just as surely as it came on those Assyrians and later came on the Babylonians. And has come on every evil uh, nation and every evil person who has ever lived. Proverbs 21 15 tells us justice is a joy to the godly, but it terrifies evildoers. Over in John 16 verse 31, Jesus asks, do you finally believe? But the time is coming, indeed it's here now when you will be scattered, each one going his own way, leaving me alone, yet I'm not alone because the Father's with me. And then he says in verse 33, I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me. And then he says, here on earth, you'll have many trials and many sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. This morning, we were looking at Revelation chapter one and uh, noticing the image of Jesus, the appearance of Jesus, how he appeared to John uh, when John was exiled on the Isle of Patmos. And, and that appearance of Christ, his amazing appearance and, and the difference uh, from his, uh, the way he had looked when John had known him in life and, and uh, through the days that they were together ministering to people and preaching to people. Here, Jesus lets him see him as, uh, as we would expect to see him on the day of judgment, on his return. And this bright and glorious and terrifying image of a great and mighty God who comes to bring justice uh, comforts us with his appearance, comforts us with his message that he's not going to allow evil to go on forever, that at some point, it is going to come to an end because he has overcome the world. And like he tells us in Revelation 1, 18, he has the keys. He has the keys to, to death and the grave. I want to point something out. The fact is we don't get joy and we don't get comfort from the fact that God's enemies will be destroyed. In fact, that would be something that, that would hurt to some extent. We, we recognize the evil that is being done even in our world today. And we know that judgment is going to come, that, that justice will be done. When we look at the atrocities that occur in our world, uh, the, the people who are, who are killed, the innocent people who are killed daily, uh, the innocent children who are being aborted, even in our wonderful country, a country that, that we think of as the, the greatest place that has ever been, and, and I truly believe that it is, the freest place in this world, even at this moment in time. And yet... There's great sin, even in this wonderful land. There's sin everywhere because we live in a world of sin, a world of sin and death. And so our comfort, our joy isn't in the fact that 
others will be destroyed for their evil. Uh, rather, uh, we receive peace and, and we receive his comfort in the fact, knowing that evil will not always reign. Eventually, justice is served. And it's this hope that we have in Jesus. Uh, not, not somehow that, that uh, others are going to be punished, but a hope that someday we will be relieved. It sells us very, very carefully and very, very seriously to take heart. Take heart. I know you're going to have many tri trials and many sorrows. You have peace in me because I have overcome the world. Last week we were looking in Micah and again, verse 8 of chapter 6, he says, uh, the Lord has told you what to do and what he requires of you to do what is right, to love mercy, to walk humbly with your God. To, to do what is right, to love mercy, all right, and to, to walk humbly with your God. And so it is important that we have justice in our personal lives, that we recognize what is right and what is wrong, and we hold ourselves to the standard that we read in the Scriptures. Remember, it is the Word of Christ that will judge us on that last day. And so as we read His Word, we must put it to action in our life we must actually do what he says not just hear it and go away from it and, and think about how it applies but actually apply it and so often it's uh it's just a human nature and it's easy for us to to judge other people by their actions and judge ourselves according to our intentions but that's not justice justice is to recognize our own actions or our inaction and say you know what it is wrong for me to neglect the things that I should be doing that I know need to be done. In fact, James 4 and verse 17 tells us to him who knows to do good but doesn't do it, it is sin. It's sin not to do what is right, not to do justice, not to love mercy, not to walk humbly with God. And so we must. Over in Philippians chapter 3, Paul tells us that we're citizens of heaven. And that we can be rescued by a Savior who comes from heaven. Our Messiah, He destroys our enemy and He breaks the power of those who hold us captive. And Paul is describing here something that, that really sounds more like a POW camp as he looks at our sinful world. The fact that we're not citizens here, that we're sojourners, that we're just traveling through. We're headed to a better place, but we've got to get through this one first. But you know, it's not about our oppressors getting what's coming to them that should comfort our hearts. The message to the enemy soldiers is always an invitation to repentance and to life. There's always opportunity with a loving Father in heaven to repent and to stop doing those things that war against the Spirit and start doing those things that enrich our spiritual lives. See, the message to the empire of darkness, to the evil spirits in the spirit, uh, spiritual realm, it's very clear. Your reign is over. Christ has overcome. Christ has trampled the darkness. Christ has uh, uh, defeated sin and he has defeated death. He took the punishment for my sin and for yours, even for the sin of those who all lived before us in the old times and, and those who were even there at the death of Christ. Those who have lived since then, Jesus' sacrifice on the cross was a sacrifice that atoned for every sin that was or could be committed. And yet now he offers us hope. He says, uh, it has been paid, but you must take advantage. You must make a decision. You must choose to follow him rather than continuing in the evil that characterizes our sinful world. So it's your choice. And Nahum, like the other minor prophet, uh, prophets, uh, turns it on us, doesn't he? As we see Jesus in his message, we again see ourselves and our need for repentance, our need for justice, our need for mercy, and our deep need to see ourselves for who we truly are in humility, humbling ourselves before a mighty and powerful God in heaven. I'm thankful for the book of Nahum. Looking forward to Habakkuk next time. Uh, but as we just consider his message, evil will be destroyed. It might not be destroyed today. It might not be destroyed tomorrow. But it will be destroyed. And we have hope because we know justice is coming. Oppression will be relieved. And we'll live in the presence of God for all eternity. Tonight, 
if you have that hope because you've put your trust in Jesus, I want to encourage you to continue to keep your hope, to keep the faith, to walk humbly with your God. And if you haven't come to Christ, if you haven't made Him the Lord of your life and, and sought Him with your whole heart, turned your mind completely to the cross and decided to make sure your actions are in line with the actions of Christ, if you haven't obeyed the gospel, why not tonight? Why not obey His gospel and start your life anew tonight to begin a, a, another year that's coming, 2019, Lord willing, would you begin that in Christ? Would you begin that as a fresh uh, new walk with the Lord, a, a new way of life that brings you into a new year where you can walk with Jesus and He would walk with you. If you need Jesus tonight, why don't you come while we stand and we sing this song?